Yep, it's 12 o'clock even. So All right. let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm Chris Story, project manager for the East 64th Street project. Um, welcome to today's update meeting upon the project, and specifically phase two, which is McKinley to Portland. Uh, with me today, I've got a few other presenters from uh, Public Works. I've got the design engineer, Jacob Hammes. From Real Property Service, I got Troy Stevens. From Tacoma Power, Jill Rempe. And from Tacoma Water, Katie Lindbergh. Uh, we'll just be covering uh, a little bit of background on the project and then where it's going and the anticipated schedule. Um, as you've probably heard once or twice, depending on when you came in, uh, we got some housekeeping things to just make sure we're all aware of. This is a one hour event. So we're going from noon to one, one will be stopping. The presentation I'm expecting to take about 20 minutes, we'll see. And then after that, we'll be answering questions. If you have questions, none of them will be verbal. It'll all be written. So there's a QA and a button at the bottom of your screen on this interface. If you click on that, you should be able to start typing and then uh, Tina will read them off to us and we'll do our best to answer for you. And if we can't get to any questions, we'll provide answers on the website later. This presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the website later. And you'll see the website uh, URL once or twice through the presentation. And I think oh, we don't have the chat function, that's right. So you should be able to get to it. Other than that, it's on cityatacoma.org and go to construction projects for the city and you'll find East 64th. Um, see if I've missed anything. Uh, you're all on mute, like I mentioned before, so no, no vocalizations, it'll all be written questions. And this presentation, along with what's already on the website, which is we have a plan set to show you what's happening in front of your property. If you're curious, there's a link on the, the project webpage. It'll take you to that and you just gotta flip through. It'll have your address number and hopefully the owner's name, unless you're a renter, then it won't have your name. You have to know who you're renting from, that type of thing. And now we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, the 64th Street project is a three phase project. Phase one, uh, which was Pacific to McKinley was completed last year. And essentially that design is being carried forward to phase two, which is the green section on your screen, uh, McKinley to Portland. Uh, we anticipate utility work, which is the re relocation of the power poles and all the aerial lines occurring later this year with the actual road construction project occurring next year and more on that as we move forward. And we've uh, received a funding for that, so we're getting going. And then the unfunded portion of the project, which is phase three, which will happen some more time in the future, is Portland Avenue east to the city limits. Uh, we'll be pursuing funding for that, and we hopefully will start design later this year. Um, then, as I mentioned, phase one is completed. The anticipated schedule is uh, pole relocation this year. Uh, we've already done some utility work on the very westernmost phase. Um, I think PSE got in there and did some work while we're doing phase one, but they may have some more work. Um, and then the road work will follow in 2023. We expect the construction for the road to take about a year. Uh, the utility work will take most of this year or part of this year, depending how that all comes together. And then phase three, like I mentioned, is unfunded and we'll be pursuing funding. For those of you who like numbers, uh, this phase of the project is estimated to cost eight and a half million dollars for the road work. Four million of that was provided by the Transportation Improvement Board grant, which we just received. This is the second grant we've received on the overall project. They funded the first phase as well. So they've been a big partner and looking forward to continuing that relationship going forward if we're fortunate enough. And the city is then adding four and a half million dollars itself to match that grant. And then Public Utilities has two groups working on this. We've got Water doing that about a $400,000 worth of work. And then Tacoma Power, and to, oh, yeah, I got the right, about, is estimating $900,000 worth of work. And I think with that, Jacob, I think you're up and ready to go on the design. Yes, so as Chris said, I'm Jacob Hammes. I'm the design engineer uh, for this project. Um, I wanna say that the phase two uh, is intended to continue the same aesthetic and design as phase one. Um, and phase three, when we get there, will be a continuation of that. Um, and so this project will be as uh, phase one was, it'll be a two lane road um, with sidewalk and bike lane on both sides. Uh, one lane of parking will be on the north side, which is a difference from phase um one uh phase one we had two side parking phase two we only have one side parking and this is due to the the limited space that we have on phase two which is different than uh phase one um there'll be a buffer area 
on the north side as well. It'll have stamped concrete uh, planting areas, uh, street trees, and that's where the parallel parking will be. Um, and then there'll be a continuous uh, stamped buffer on the south side. Um, there'll also be new street lighting along the entire project. Uh -huh. On the next slide, uh, we can look at the cross section, and what that looks like. Um, we have um, going from left to right, uh, we have the new sidewalk and then the bike lane. So this would be on the south side and a buffer area. Um, and then you would have your two drive lanes um, and then the park lane, which is on the north, um, another buffer and a bike lane and sidewalk. On the north side, on the second cross section there, um, you'll see that we show street trees and planting um, where we had shown parking and this is just where we don't have space for parking, we'll be installing street trees and plantings in that area. Um, this is just a general overview of what the project will mostly look like uh, in most areas um, with the green hatching being the planting. Um, and then you see the open parking spaces on the north side and the street trees. Um, you'll see on the north and south, there's some black dashed lines um, close to the properties on the back side of the sidewalk. Um, that would be CMU retaining walls. Um, that are planned uh, on the project website. You can look over the plans and see uh, what would be going on directly in front of your property um, and whether there'll be retaining walls or parking, um, what we have planned for driveways, um, as well as what we have planned for plantings uh, near your property specifically. On the next slide, um, you'll see these are examples from phase one. Um, so in the upper left, we see what phase one looked like after completion with the retaining wall, the sidewalk and the bike lane, um, as well as a park lane there. And then uh, in the lower right, we see, uh, we're showing you what phase one originally looked like before we started the project. Um, it's quite a difference. Um, as well for this project, we'll be including new storm sewer mains um, and catch basins to collect water. Um, as you can see in the lower right, there was standing water at the beginning of phase one before we started construction. Um, and we have accounted for that as well in phase two to collect any standing water that is causing issues now. Um, as far as traffic control for this project, um, we're looking at directional closures that will occur along the full, uh, for full blocks. Um, this is similar to what we did before on phase one. Um, and we would be routing traffic to either 72nd or 56 for the directional closures. Um, as well, um, if you're concerned about access to your properties, um, the contractor will be required to to provide access to properties. There may be limited times where access is, is not available just because we're working um, so close to uh, different properties as we go, but there will be, for the most part, access to your property throughout the project. Um, on the next slide, we see uh, what we anticipate Portland to look like at the end of the project. Again, we continue into phase three, which would be east of Portland Avenue. Um, but Portland will be generally the same uh, as it is now um, with uh, two drive lanes uh, and a turn lane in each direction. Um, The next one we go back, we're looking at, there's two types of, uh, of retaining walls that um, are potential for each property. In the upper left is our CMU retaining walls we talked about earlier. Um, and this, uh, this is used on properties where we have quite a great difference between the sidewalk and the retaining wall. 
as well uh, in the lower right, we have what we call our poured concrete wall. Um, and this is for short differences um, that we think are better made up with a wall rather than sloping um, your yard down to the road. Um, and we would install those where a small difference of, of 16 inches or less exists between the sidewalk and your property. Um, uh, as well, where we have properties that have uh, that have a grade difference exceeding 30 inches between the finished sidewalk grade uh, and the yard, uh, we'll have to install a fence if there's none that exists. Um, this would be a, a four foot chain link fence as we see in the upper right. Um, uh, and if you have an existing uh, uh, an existing fence, we will attempt to match what is what is there. Um, so typically, if you have a wood fence, we would be installing a new wood fence uh, at your property face. If you have an existing chain link fence, we would be installing a new chain link fence there. Um, that is all that I have as far as an overview of the design. Um, Next, you'll be hearing from Troy Stevens uh, with Real Property Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Troy Stevens and I'm with Real Property Services. This afternoon, we're gonna be talking about an overview of the right of way, federal state requirements, and then our two primary acquisitions that we're gonna be dealing with on this project. Now there's temporary construction easements and right of way dedications. Go ahead and advance, yeah, thanks. Chris. All right, so an overview. What is the right of way anyway, right? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, this is a topic that confuses a lot of people. And looking at the slide that we have up, you see the heavy, dark, black line, right? And what that is, that's two things. It's the property line, but it's also called the right of way line. All that property in between those black lines is the city right of way. And a majority of the project happens inside the city right of way. Now, some of you may be thinking that city property, that's a misconception. It's a, it's a type of super easement that we have, and it allows us to do all this work. The thing is, some of the property that we need for the project is outside of that. It's a very small amount, but we need a little bit. So Chris, why don't you go ahead and extend to the next slide. Part of the acquisition of those right away and temporary construction easements require us to follow very strict federal and state guidelines. We'll work very closely with WashDOT staff, and they help to make sure that we follow the rules and compensate all the property owners that we're gonna be working with that need the, either the temporary or the permanent right away dedication from. They, we work closely with them to make sure that we follow the guidelines and compensate everyone for that. And we follow something called the local agency guidelines, which you see up on the screen. Perfect, and as it states, we. Yes, we have to make, pay fair market value for any of those property rights that we obtain. Go ahead and forward it, Chris. Now, our first type of work or first document that we'll need from people is called a temporary construction easement. It's only for the length of the project. And there's about 80 folks that we're gonna be requiring temporary construction easements for. And they're about two years and you're compensated for that two-year use of the property. Now, some of you may be saying, are you gonna be using my property for the entire two years? No, it, there's gonna be a limited time that we use it. And what happens is as the construction moves along the right of way, they'll need your property. But for you know, an indeterminate amount of time, they won't need your property specifically. And the appraisal that's done takes that into consideration but you are compensated for the equivalent of that two years. And the temporary construction easements are important because it allows us to temporarily access your property to build 
if we need to, those fences or walls that Jacob was talking about on your property. Or in some instances, if it's a sidewalk, we might not be building a wall or a fence, but we need the two feet back a walk to work on your property. The sidewalk itself will be in the city right away, but we just need that two feet back a walk to work during construction. And that's why we need a temporary construction easement. Go ahead and move it onto this next slide, Chris. Now, for some of you, and there's gonna be 11 of you, we need something called a right-of-way dedication. Now that's different from that temporary construction easement in that it's a permanent right. What happens is those black lines that I talked about, that city right away, well, for 11 of you, we'll need just little bits and pieces. It's not, it's not your whole property. It's just little bits that we'll need for the sidewalk or for those walls because those walls that Jacob shows you, they need to be in the city right away. That's a city wall and it needs to be in the city right away. And that's why we need those dedications. The little slivers or bits that we'll get from you, for, acquire from you, will then be part of that city right away. That was between those black lines that you saw there on that early slide. And I think that's about it, Chris, for me. And with that, you know, I'll be happy to answer, answer any questions at the end if there is any. I'll turn it over to Joe to take, take us forward in the power discussion. Joe. Well, I'd like to welcome all of you uh, that are listening. Uh, my name is Joe Rempe. I am a uh, lead distribution engineer uh, here at for Tacoma Power. And our engineers, uh, Jared and Ilya, have been working on this project diligently. And uh, But I get the speaking part. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to discuss the project that in three pieces. Uh, we'll talk about the project phases. Uh, the schedule, and then we'll answer uh, a couple of questions that usually come up on these projects uh, quite frequently and try to get out ahead of that. So if you can move on to the next slide. Thanks, Chris. So um, I guess the first question is why are the poles and our facilities moving? And in general, uh, they're in the way of the new sidewalks or other right of way improvements. So with the uh, available right of way uh, that is there, this pushes our poles, and these will be new poles, will be re relocated to the edge of the right of way or property line and within the right of way. So we, we don't intend to put our poles on private property on this project, but within right of way. Uh, and generally, our work comes out first. And so uh, we hope not to surprise anybody with where the right of way line is. But uh, sometimes that does happen. And those properties with underground services uh, that extend from our poles will likely have to be adjusted uh, to the new pole locations. That's just giving you a, a little bit of heads up on that. So if we can move on to the next slide. So in preparation for, for us to really get going on the project, we have a number of things that have to happen first. And you'll see that is first of all, the survey. Uh, the city will have a surveyor go out and find, or at least mark the edge of right away or the property line. And then our engineers will go out and stake where the new poles go. And that's how it works. And then once that's done, we call 811. And I'm sure you've seen the advertising on television or radio. And just like you would have to call 811 uh, for utility locations, we have to do that too. And so they'll be seeing uh, a bunch of paint on the ground, all different colors. And those different colors represent different utilities. And the idea behind calling 811 is so that when we dig a hole for our pole, we're not going to break any of the other utilities on the way. Just the same as if you were to call it. And then along the way, um, if there are trees that may be in conflict with our lines, uh, our tree crews will come out and in a preliminary effort, trim those trees or top them uh, so that they're not in the way of the new lines. And then uh, as part of this, again, going back to finding out where the um, edge of right-of-way is, there may be some 
uh, adjustments to fences, landscapings, and walls that may need to occur so that we can put our facility in and, and get out of the way of uh, the city's project, essentially. So we will work with uh, property owners ahead of time. It's not like we just show up and, and do it. We typically make contact and make sure that you're aware of what we're going to do uh, prior to that. Yep, next slide. So uh, our crews, typically uh, the big orange trucks will come out and set uh, new poles. And these poles will support what we call transmission. And that's on, uh, and if you look up on your neighborhood, you'll see that we have some really tall poles and uh, the wires on top are 115,000 volts. And then about a halfway up those poles, we have cross arms. And on those cross arms, that's 12,500 volt distribution lines. And then below that, you'll see the transformers and the service wires for your homes. Um, once those poles are set, we'll string some new wire. It, you'll see us transferring likely the transmission uh, wire, but the distribution wire, the 12,500 volt, we'll be stringing new wire in for that. And then we'll start transferring uh, the services to your homes uh, from the old poles to the new poles. And one of the reasons we do it that way is so that we can have the lines, both sets energized and your outage to your home is minimized by quite a bit doing it this way. We then top we call it top or cut the top of the poles off right just above the communication lines. And then at that point, the communication companies start moving their facilities from the old poles to the new poles. And this can take a little while. And then once all of those transformers are complete, uh, the old, the, what remains of the old poles will be removed. Okay, next. So I, this is another before and after pictures. Uh, again, E64, it's kind of tends to how it looks today. And then if we go to the next image, and this the focus here is not only on the roadway, but on the poles. You can see that uh, we have a tall transmission pole uh, just past the, uh, the structure, that white structure there. And also there's a cross arm sticking out from the side and that's the distribution wire. And then below all that is the communication wires. And that's what it'll look like in the end. All right. And then we start, we tend to start here in the spring of 2022. Uh, the city would like to see our work done along with that of the communication companies by the end of the year. And we honestly don't know how long it'll take for the other utilities to get their work done. But generally, and this type of a project, um, and if you were keeping track of the phase one, it took us about six months to get our work done. So we anticipate that it'll take uh, roughly the same amount on this project. And next, so uh, it's not uncommon for someone to say, well, why don't you go underground? Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is cost. Uh, undergrounding is, is more expensive than overhead, especially when we're uh, working with an existing system. Uh, we do have to put large green boxes in uh, people's front yards uh, when that occurs. And then the cost of, convert, of transferring the services on the homes to underground is completely picked up by the customer. Um, it's not something that utility will pay for. Again, going back to how to pay for underground, that's a more of a uh, local improvement district or LID process. Uh, and I'm not gonna go over that whole issue. That's something that uh, if people are interested in, that's uh, the city has some people for that to discuss that with. However, if you wanna uh, convert the service of your home today to underground, uh, we do have a phone number here. Uh, you would contact our new service engineering and they'd be more than happy to help you. And as far as power outages, yes, there will be some. Everybody will likely see at least one power outage on this project. They will be, hopefully they'll be short. Uh, and short, I understand is a relative term. Um, I would expect that the longest the outages might be would be pretty close to an eight hour day, but most of them will be quite a bit shorter than that. 
Uh, it just depends on what we're doing and, and it's all for safety. Uh, safety is our number one uh, issue with our employees and with the public and with the folks that we're working with. And, um, and we're not gonna do something that'll put any of our employees in a position where they're not gonna go home the same way they showed up. So I think that is it, right, Chris? Yep. So I am more than happy to hand this off to Katie Lindbergh of the water. Here you go, Katie. Afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Katie Lindbergh, and I'm here to talk about the scope of work Tacoma Water will be performing. Tacoma Water plans to construct approximately 1,400 feet of new four-inch PVC water main from McKinley Avenue, a little past Portland to East Q Street. During construction, customers will still receive water from the existing main, but customers may experience temporary disruption of water just during the transfer process from the old main to the new one. At most, this will be eight hours and customers will be given notice ahead of time. This new water main will improve existing customers' water pressure. Water pressures may increase by up to 40 PSI or pounds per square inch. And to regulate this, pressure reducing valves will be installed for each property as seen on the next slide. Pressure reducing valves or PRVs will allow for the manual adjustment of water pressure at each property. And it will be installed inside a composite as seen in the picture. Because of this, ownership of the PRVs will be the responsibility of the property owners after it has been installed. Tacoma Water Crews will install the PRV and set the PRVs to approximately 50 PSI for each customer. Customers can choose to leave it at 50 PSI or decide to adjust the valves to their preference. There will be an outreach to educate customers on how to operate and maintain the valves when the crews come to install the PRVs. So any specific PRV maintenance related questions should be saved for that outreach. And that's all, so I'll pass it on to Chris Story. Thank you, Katie. Um, if you've got a question and it doesn't get handled now, or it comes up later when you look at the website, by all means, contact me. I can get you in touch with the other people, but we'll put this out there. So if you've got specific questions related to water, you know, I think Katie got off the hook and Allie got tagged for the water stuff there. And Joe is also off the hook. Uh, these will be on the presentation on the website so you can contact people with specific questions regarding you know, water outages or power outages, if that's what your concern is. Um, if you do go to the website at cityoftacoma.org, look for city construction projects, and then click on E64th if you don't have that shortened URL. Uh, it's on the lower right hand of the first opening screen, you'll see the city construction projects. And after that, the next page, just scroll down, you'll find the right project. And then, oops, too far. Uh, there's the shortened URL for those that are, can type faster than I can. Um, and now I think we're open for questions. Tina, as I take it back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, someone did ask in the Q&A below if there was gonna be a Q&A. So if, again, if you have any questions, please start loading them up in the Q&A button down below. Um, we did receive a couple of questions previously, Chris, so I'm just gonna start with those. Uh, the first one, we live at X, East 64th, and are planning to install a retaining wall at the front of our property this year. I've noticed where the work has already been done further down 64th, that a lot of this type of stuff has redone, was, excuse me, was redone by the city to match or integrate into the sidewalks. Am I wasting my time and money by starting this project this year? Will the city be ripping it out, make way for whatever is coming? So uh, trying to be consistent with what I sent my email response, uh, it depends. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you want to do with the retaining wall. Um, we do have plans to build retaining walls at certain locations. Uh, during Jacob's presentation, you could see, I need to stop sharing my screen, don't I? Oops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Anyway, um, we will be putting retaining walls at certain locations. And if the elevation of the sidewalk is generally gonna come up and the sidewalk could be closer to the property line than it was or is now in most cases, I think Jacob, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. So there's gonna be an elevation change and a position change. If you wanna build your wall now, you do you do have the risk of us coming in and going, that needs to be redone because it doesn't match up. I'd be happy to try and coordinate where we think we're gonna build so that if you do wanna proceed with your project, which 
I would assume your wall would need to be on your property side. Well, we can build the wall for the project on the right of way side. So there'd be a difference in location. Um, we could try and coordinate that, but it still runs the risk that maybe something gets built wrong and we'd have to re redo something. So uh, if you got specific questions, I'd be happy to answer those as they come up. Uh, they missed All something right. there, Tina? Yeah, thank you. So the next one, for those of us who live on East 64th Street and do not have parking in the alley, will we have regular access to our driveways during road construction? If not, what safe alternatives do we have? Uh, I've also answered this one already, but I'll try to repeat myself. During construction, there's going to be moments when the driveways are brought, blocked. Um, mostly, it'll be a work day outage as we're trenching through or we're demolishing something in preparation for building it back. And what I've seen people do on phase one is we, we give you notice that, hey, we're going to be in this area from this time to this time. We'll have contractor or inspector knock on your door and go, hey, tomorrow we're coming if it's, you know, we haven't seen a response or anything. They've moved their cars out in the morning or the evening before, park them on a side street or further down East 64th where work isn't occurring. And then they'll come back at night after we're done. And that's generally been the impact for most cases. However, there will be periods when we're paving and the concrete on your driveway has to cure or the asphalt out front has to cure and we can't drive on it. You may experience a blockage of your driveway for 24 to 36 hours somewhere in there, you know, prep work and all that. And again, your car would need to be relocated or some people have chosen to just hermit it tunnels in and, and put up with it till they can move later. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you, Chris. Last one that came in previously. We have a narrow two vehicle driveway and we have three vehicles. My husband generally parks on the street in front of our house. Will he be able to do that for the most of the construction or will he need to find a semi-permanent alternative? So as mentioned, um, we're gonna have directional closures. So we'll try to work on one side of the road at a time. I don't anticipate us taking the whole stretch from McKinley to Portland. We should be going in sections across the project, but sometimes the contractor changes how things are conceptualized in our mind. So the long story short is most of the time you should be able to park on the street if there hasn't been construction there. But if there's been demolition or whatever and we're changing grade, you would need to relocate your car similar to what I talked about before. And that, that could be a longer period of time than a day or something, because if we're working on a three block stretch and adjusting grades and putting in curb, the parking area may not be available because we're readjusting everything and the, the road width changes and location changes, that type of thing. All right, we're getting several questions coming in. So thank you, everyone. Next one, are you guys installing cameras on the street? Lord knows we need that on the east side. Uh, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, I do not think we are doing that. No, we're not, um, we're not installing cameras. Um, I, I will add that um, one one of the, the goals with this project um, is, is to lower speeds, um, if that's a concern. Um, and we're doing that through narrowing the roadway. Um, as you can see in phase one, we narrowed the roadway quite a bit um, if you've driven down it. Um, and it does feel feel tighter. Um, and so that that is a goal um, that we're leaning towards in this design. Thank you. How do we see our specific property plans again? And how do we know if we fall into the group of property owners who have easement issues? Uh, if you go to the city website and go in construction projects and then get to the project webpage, there's a link near the top that says, if you wanna view plans to the current project, click here. That'll pop that uh, set of plans open. And it's about three pages long and it's got two bands you keep going left to right and you'll see and just find your property. Um, it's similar to what you've seen on the presentation from Jacob. We've got gray for the concrete, black for asphalt. It'll show you the striping, where the bike lanes will be, where the planters will be. Uh, and that if that doesn't clear to you, then by all means, send in a question. And we can go from there. You'll see near uh, the property lines, a black dashed line that's thicker than the rest. That indicates where we anticipate putting in retaining walls. Uh, what was the rest of the question? This might be a Troy question. The rest of it was, how do they know if they fall into the group of property owners who have easement issues? I believe the plans that Jacob has posted show what, pro no, not yet. Okay, so we can, the property owners can contact me directly. My information was provided. Be happy to talk to those specific property owners to let them know 
we have plans that do show the affected parcels and I can definitely share that with folks. Thank you, Troy. Katie, this one might be for you. Um, the question is any sewer issues? Um, no sewer issues, no. Thank you. And then thank you, Council Member Ushka. We got a few questions coming in. Is there a planned loss of trees and will, will they be otherwise replaced? We already have lowest tree canopy in Puget Sound. That's a fun question. So on phase one, we did our best to save what trees we could. Uh, those that straddled the property line with the root ball system, if we had to take too much because of grade changes, uh, we did have to unfortunately remove some large trees. There's others we were able to design around it if we found the root ball wasn't as big of impact as it could have been. Um, and then Jacob, why don't you talk about the street tree problem on the design or how that works? Um, you're talking, Chris, I assume you're talking about adding new street trees. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned in the pre presentation, um, we are putting in street trees. It's going to be basically wherever we can uh, along the entire project. Um, it, and that's going to be based on um, available space. So trees need a certain amount of space. Um, and, and that's going to be that space is limited by other things that we need to install with the project, such as driveways, uh, parallel parking, uh, the bike lanes. Um, and and as well as we have certain offsets from the intersections that we have to maintain for street trees. But outside of those blockages, we'll be putting in as many street trees as we really can everywhere along the, the project. Um, but most of them will be on the north side of the project. Thank and you. To, and then to reiterate, we'll protect as best we can, but sometimes the root ball system, since we can't view it now, uh, creates a problem later when we discover it during construction and we, we deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Are you making sure that you contact each property owner personally? How will access be assured for situations like medical emergencies? We will be sending out flyers to everybody. Uh, those that wish to meet with us will be happy to come out and talk. Um, we had ADA situations and high medical alert uh, locations on phase one. Uh, we try to alert the contractor to those private those properties that have those issues. So if you have something going on, by all means, tell me so that we're aware and we can keep notifying the contractor. We've got to be ready to create access here if there is a medical problem. Otherwise, they will accommodate as best they can. But if I got a five foot trench open in front of a driveway, we will do the best we can. We may have to reroute something around. We'll put a steel plate down, that type of thing. You get the idea. But if you've got some sort of condition we need to be aware of, that'd be very helpful to know ahead of time so we can alert the contractor that this is a situation we wanna get through as fast as possible or make plans to accommodate otherwise, if that helps. Will the traffic lights and pedestrian bike intersection be the same at Portland as it is at Pacific? Jacob, you wanna take that? Um, the current plan is that the, the, it'll be very similar. Um, We'll have bike detection. Um, the lights will be upgraded to match similar to what we did at Pacific and McKinley already. Um, and that, that would be, yeah, generally the goal. Next one. So everyone on the south side will be losing their street parking? Yes, the street parking will be shifted to the north side. We don't have room to accommodate on both. And the, the way to get the most parking in on the street, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, was to put it to the north. Uh, so we, we, we understand the impact that makes. Unfortunately, putting in all the infrastructure that's desired does create compromises and, and stuff like that. Jacob, is anything wrong? No, that was all correct. Yeah, we, we went through and we, we uh, measured up to see what was the most street parking we could get because we knew we could only do one side um, and the north side was the side we could get get the most parking on um, and so that that's why it's there we have a sidewalk question are the sidewalks going to be wide like the rest of the street on 64th and why are the sidewalks so wide where the lights are located turning with the wide sidewalk has caused issues when turning for large vehicles 
Go ahead. You want to start, Jacob, or me? Uh, well, I just the the sidewalk will be as wide as it is in phase one. Yes. Um, okay. That is true. And then the, the at the intersections, yes, we're doing bulb outs again, correct? Jacob. I um bulb outs is not really the I guess I wouldn't say that's the right term. Um, but we are changing the radius of the corner um, and we're narrowing 64th itself. Um, but the the turning should turning for vehicles should not be affected at McKinley or at uh, Portland, I mean. Um, but yes, the, the narrow road is getting narrower and we are having wide sidewalks as well as adding in the bike lane adds additional width um, to that area. Thank you, Jacob. Portland Avenue is scheduled for repaving this year. Will the 64th intersection be ripped up in both 2022 and 2023? Uh, yes, if the, well, Jacob, I don't know. I have to only check on that. Is there's there gonna be work at the Portland intersection? If they're repaving it this year, you'll see some work. When we get in there to redo the intersection for our work, you'll see some work in 2023. Um, I need to go back and talk to that project to see how far into the intersection they're going or whether they're going to pull back to our limits. Well, Jacob, do you know anything about that? I don't think we've talked about that yet. Oh, we haven't talked about that, but we would co coordinate the projects to try and limit the overlap between the two. Why is a chain link fence necessary? These tend to not be very attractive. Can a property owner opt not to have a chain link fence? Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. I'll start Just to add in when you're ready. Uh, the chain link fence, like, because we match in kind for in kind. Uh, if you want to change to, a, do we have people, we had people change from chain like the wood uh, before on the previous project, correct? Yes, we had some, some people yeah. who requested to have a wood fence instead. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll be getting an option when we come to you and say that we're rebuilding the wall. We need a temporary construction easement to build the wall. When the wall is over a certain height, we have to have fall protection, which is what drives putting the fences in, generally speaking. The other thing that drives putting the fences back in is security for, for houses that want their fence line reestablished. I mean, we could just cut the fence and continue on, but that doesn't make much sense. So we reestablish a chain link fence to a chain link fence. Um, part of our outreach will involve, hey, we're going to be cutting your fence back, or we'll be building this wall and putting a new fence in. Which fence type do you want? And the choices we gave last time, Jacob, were four foot or six foot, chain link or wood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to, yeah, just to hopefully to clarify a little bit more what Chris was saying, um, when we exceed a certain height on a wall between the top of the top of wall or, or what would be your yard um, and the sidewalk below, uh, we have certain requirements for fall protection that need to be met um, and the minimum for that would be the four foot chain link fence um, that we need to install to prevent trip and falls and injuries. How does this affect side streets and 63rd, 65th? Will we also be notified of the same outages and effects? Side street, some owners paid for out of pocket for better roads. K Street, for example, will those be affected? So, if you're talking about 63rd and 65th, which are the ones one block up each or either way, um, what will happen is as the project moves through, and you saw in phase one, those streets may get more traffic. We don't plan to be building anything out there. Um, we'll be the side streets heading north south, we do have to tie back into. So there'll be some work 25, 30, 40, 50 feet, depending on what we're doing to get the grades to match. But 63rd and 65th may become minor detour routes, not by intention. We direct people to the other main arterials. Um, but some people who know how to get around will do what they do. We can't stop that. Jacob, am I missing anything on that? No, that's all correct. As you said, we we do we will do minor work on the, the north south side streets that are that are attached to 64 um, to, get, to get that all to tie in correctly. I think a, oh, sorry, I just remembered. I think there's also some sanitary or storm sewer work. I forget which road um, that may go a couple hundred feet up one of the side streets northbound, but I, I can identify that in a question answer on the website. Go ahead. Sorry, Tina. Yeah. No, that's all right. Try this maybe for you. I'm at 830 East 64th Street. 
will there be a cost to me for the chart changes to my property? Thank you, Tina. I appreciate the question because it helps me mention something that I wanted to mention. And that is when we come to the right away phase of this project, the city will be most likely working with a consultant to acquire the, the property rights that we need. The, cons the consultant will send out letters to the affected property owners with either the easement or right away dedication. And it'll list how much we're going to be paying for those property rights. I'll let Chris confirm, but as far as I know, none of the, the project won't require the property owners to pay any money. We will be paying property owners for those ten, for those property rights that we need, however. Yeah. yeah, so we'll pay for the property rights. We will, the fences and the walls that we're building or have to replace if we're damaging them because we're coming through, we will uh, replace those at the project cost. What has happened is sometimes property owners have more work they want to do to tie in. That would not be a project cost. That would be something the property owner would handle. That way, if they want to do additional work above what, you know, putting it back into, and Troy, what's the, the magic word? It's the same as or better condition. And yes, first, that's correct. That's always a fun thing to explain. So if, if you had a secure fence before, we'll put a sec secure fence back later. Um, the same doesn't mean we're going to put the same white and green fence back. It's going to be the wood fence that you saw in the picture. If you understand what I'm driving at there, anything else I should cover there, Troy? I think that covers it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Katie, this one's for you. What is the current PSI versus the planned PSI? If it is a lot higher, it could be a problem on pipes in older homes. That's true. Um, the average PSI in the area is around 40 PSI. When we install the new PRVs, we'll be setting it to 50 PSI. However, it will be within your property, so it's your ownership. So at any time, we'll teach you how to change that PRV pressure. But when they install it, if your old pipes are an issue, you can request to keep it at 40 PSI so that nothing is changed. Thank you, Katie. This is a statement. Thank you for all your efforts. This 64th Street project has been number one on our East Side Neighborhood Council project list for 20 years. If someone parks and blocks access to the new sidewalk, is there any way to make sure wheelchair users and others who need the new sidewalk are not blocked by the vehicles? I, as a wheelchair user, have already been blocked when rolling down the new McKinley Avenue sidewalk. That, that is a difficult question. I, I feel your pain there. Um, we try to educate and have tried to educate on phase one uh, about, hey, the bike lane needs to be open, the sidewalk needs to be open, um, and you shouldn't be parking here. It's, that's not the intent. Um, education, uh, we've outreached with, um, we've had police officers discuss people to educate them. Uh, you need to help us understand where the problems are, and we can uh, attempt to help. It, it's a tough situation to correct. I, I feel your pain. Will 63rd and 65th be affected by any of the outages and will we be notified of those as in 64th? This part of my question was not answered. Uh, I don't believe that there will be um... I can't say at this time that we would take any outages on 63rd up uh, for lines on 63rd and 65th, but um, if there are, it will be a shortened nature. And it would, would it be is that we're trying to connect uh, the 12,500 volt system that is on um, 64th to the system that serves your homes off of 63rd and 65th. Uh, oftentimes they can do that without taking an outage, but I can't tell you that it won't happen. Um, but it's, uh, and again, there will be an effort to notify everybody if an outage is needed uh, so that it, no one's surprised. That's, it's, our goal is not to surprise people with their lights going out. So uh, we will do our best to keep everybody informed as to what we're doing. And Katie, we don't anticipate any other water impacts other than along the 64th corridor, correct? Correct, yeah. Thank you both. 
Did phase one road changes result in lowering average speeds? To the best of my knowledge, I've heard yes. Uh, that doesn't mean there's an occasional person who ignores it, but in general, I've heard that the traffic speeds have reduced. Uh, other people know something different, by all means, let us know. This is our last question so far. So if anybody else has any other questions, we have about 10 minutes remaining. So please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If contractors are doing something problematic, who can people call and will concerns be addressed promptly? There's a couple of ways to handle that. During construction, you can, uh, we will have a project inspector on site and he should be most likely the most immediate person you can contact. Uh, he should, you should become visible. He should become known. If you can't find him, and we'll be putting phone numbers out so you know that my phone number is, the construction manager's phone number is, and the inspector's phone number is, those are the three people you can call the city, and we can then get back to the contractor and work on dealing with whatever the problem may be. Um, we've had concerns before, we've worked it out, um, and we'll, we'll deal with what we can. We have one more that just came in. This is Liz Castor, City of Tacoma Active Transportation Coordinator. I've been in touch with parking enforcement about the issue of blocking the sidewalk and bike facilities on phase one. They have added this corridor to their hotspot list for emphasis patrols and encourage folks to report any issues to 311 under parking issues so they can track the issue. To report any issue, to report an issue via 311, you can one, call 311 from anywhere in the city of Tacoma or 253-591-5000 from anywhere else. Email csc at cityoftacoma.org. Use the Tacoma First 311 app or Tacoma First 311 online portal at cityoftacoma.org backslash Tacoma First 311. For best results on Tacoma parking issues like these, you'll want to make sure that you choose parking issues from the list of submission options. That way the request routes directly to the parking enforcement field staff directly. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. And you know, let's get that up on the website because I'm sure that all that information was easily transferable during right. vocalization. <laughs> I'm sure everybody caught all of that. You bet. Yes. You definitely will. So we got a couple more questions came coming in. You mentioned the project timeline at the beginning of this meeting. Will that be on the site? Uh, should already be there. Uh, if not, I'll, I will double check after the meeting, make sure I'm telling the truth, but I've had the general schedule up there. We haven't gotten too specific yet because we don't have a contractor on board and Joe's work is still tentatively planned for exactly when it's going to start. Right. We do have a general one up there, Chris, you are correct. Um, Council member Ushka saying thank you all. Thank you. And then we have another thank you, the thoughtful planning for East Tacoma. We are really excited to see the progress happening. So unless anybody else has any additional questions, comments to add, um, we might get a few more minutes back to your lunch hour. We appreciate the attendance. We've had a great turnout, some wonderful questions. We're gonna make a copy of all of these and we'll get this loaded onto the webpage as soon as we get this recording loaded. Any closing comments, anyone? Just thank you for attending. Anybody else got anything they wanna say? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful, where are we, Thursday? Have a wonderful Thursday. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye.